Hello, everybody. I am going to uh, introduce uh, one of our uh, next speakers, and that's going to be Andy Zoden. And I have known Andy for I've been fortunate to get to know Andy over the last couple of years. He's currently the president for the Intermountain Division. He's at the Columbine Country Club. Um, now, when we talk about somebody like who's also on here with Andy, Andy will say he's not that good of a player, but the guy's a nice player also, played for University of Texas. Uh, but what they're really excited about right now is Andy is involved with KickServe Radio, which has now been picked up by the Tennis Channel podcast. And he and Mots and also uh, Johnny Levine have been uh, having a great talk radio. Uh, and they, they get a couple of people along the way that we may have heard of. Uh, Mary Carrillo has been on with them. Uh, they've had um, uh, a guy, pretty good player, Yvonne Lindell. He's been on with them. Uh, the Mad Dog, Chris Russo, has been on, and it just keeps getting better and better. And so these guys have been doing a great job. And Andy is going to uh, introduce us a little bit more for uh, his uh, co-host tonight. Thanks so much, Pat, and thanks to all of you in Southern, Kevin Theos. It's good to see uh, Bill Riddle, and, and what a great job. It's uh, unfortunate to have to follow the energy of Paula Shebb. That was a great presentation, Paula, so thank you for that. We are very honored and very humbled to be uh, able to present for USPTA Southern, and I know that Matt's had intended to be out there live and in person in May, and hopefully we'll still make that happen down the road. Um, in introducing uh, my, my friend and business partner, I think that you all probably all know a lot about his playing resume of having won the French at, at 17 and, and winning seven majors and becoming the number one player in the world with an electrifying win over Yvonne Lindell in the 1988 US Open final. But what has been really refreshing for me is that oftentimes when we cross paths with someone who has done uh, what he has done, uh, you find those people maybe to be a little bit caught up with their own press clippings and maybe find it hard to relate to them. And as great of a player, uh, one of the greatest of all time as, as Matt's is, he's an even better human being. And having had an opportunity to work with him and watch him interact with people both on and off the court, um, he really has taken that to, to very high levels. So it is with great honor, as it always is, to be able to introduce to the USPTA Southern Division the great, the one and only Matt Spielander. Andy, thank you very much. Did you set the expectations high or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I've spent a lot of time down in, in the southern parts of the United States, in, in Atlanta, especially uh, my very good friend, one of my best friends, Mikael Pernforce, of course, is, a, is more of a Georgia uh, Georgia man than he is a Swedish man these days but so I spend a lot of time down there I know that uh, you guys are tennis nuts uh, and of course uh, Atlanta as a city is a tennis crazy city uh, Andy thank you very much uh, it's been a pleasure I, Andy we've met a few years back and for some reason um, I think we both realized that we kind of have the same idea about teaching and and the etiquette of the sport and I think we're both uh, trying to be overachievers, uh, not only as a player, but as, a, as an instructor. Um, the more I teach tennis, the more I realize that I do not know. Uh, my 26-year-old son helps me quite a bit with uh, trying to teach kids uh, what kind of technique and um, what kind of drills you can do with kids. In my day, of course, it was very easy. You had a couple of tennis balls and you just hit the ball back and forth. Um, I've never taken a private lesson in my life. My parents had never paid for one. I uh, grew up on public courts and then a club, but we didn't have a full-time coach. So I'm actually doing something that uh, uh, now, being a, a full-time pro, owning a tennis business in Haley, Idaho, Gravity Fitness and Tennis, I am really like a rookie. The first year on this tour that, Andy, you're so, such a pro at. So uh, I am... Uh, I'm um, very excited. I am nervous for this new uh, life, part of my life, for sure. More nervous about this than playing the French Open at 17, that's for sure. So great to be with you guys. So what we're going to do tonight, I want, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of the fact that Matt and I will also be presenting at the World Conference uh, in September. And I want to assure you all that these will be very different conversations. And tonight, I want to talk about 
some of the things that I've learned about Matt's that made him tick as a player that I think are still very relevant uh, philosophies and concepts that I think we can take into our clubs with both our adults and our juniors. Now, as we stated in, in the original uh, intro and, and in Matt's bio, seven major championships, he won three in 1988 alone. But what some people may not realize is that Matt's is the only player in the history of our sport to have won four major championships before his 21st birthday. So my first question to you, Matt, is what was going on in your life at age 13, 14, 15, 16 that maybe could be applied to what we are trying to impart onto some of our teenagers now that isn't certainly going to uh, guarantee them that they're going to win the French at 17 and beat Yvonne Lendl and Guillermo Vilas along the way, but might get them into the right frame of mind to maximize their potential, whether that's to become a very skilled high school player, perhaps a college player, or maybe go even beyond that. You know, Andy, I think every, every individual obviously is completely different. Uh, the circumstances are very different. Um, the coaching styles, the parents, uh, all of that is very different. So what happened to me when I was uh, 12 years old, um, I grew up in a very, very small uh, town or a village with uh, 400 people. Um, my dad and my, our neighbor actually built the only tennis court on the parking lot of the industrial factory where both my dad and my mom worked. Uh, we used to bike ride to school and we start snowing. We cross country to school at six, seven years old. Uh, and, and so I was playing tennis with a lot of grown-ups. At 12 years old, we moved into uh, the big city, Vexha, which had about 40,000 people at the time. Uh, and uh, I used to go there and play indoors a couple of times a week from when I was about nine years old. But I think what was different about me compared to the, the other uh, boys of this club, because I was the same level as all the other 12, 13-year-olds uh, in my club, I had to adapt to a new situation. When we moved, I lost uh, my soccer team. I lost my ice hockey team. I didn't feel like uh, trying to make friends uh, playing ice hockey and soccer. But tennis, um, I, I obviously kept playing tennis. But I think that the fact that I had to adapt to a new situation, a new school, a new set of friends, um, bike riding to the tennis court that was about three miles away, rather than being dropped off by my dad, in between runs to take my two older brothers to hockey. So it was very much uh, a problem solving situation very early on for me. In Sweden in those days, we didn't have any indoor courts. Bjornborg uh, broke through uh, in Sweden, I would say about 1976, 1977, uh, winning Wimbledon then a couple of times. That's when they started building tennis courts. Me and Stefan Edberg, for example, is from the same state. We grew up on, on one indoor court, so uh, we got used to playing very, very little tennis. I used to have 45-minute sessions when I now lived in town three times a week. That's it. Uh, we used to run and pick up balls, uh, and uh, every single shot we hit was, was worth something. So I think that helped. But Andy, interesting, and everybody, the most interesting thing that I've run into in the last five years is that uh, one of those boys that I played with when I was 12, 13 years old, he was my doubles partner. He's a year older than me. We were exactly the same level uh, at 12, 13. We played a couple of sets about three years ago. So now he's 54 and I'm 53. And we're back to being exactly the same level one more time. So I'm not really sure what happened there for about 40 years, why I took the step up and was winning during those years, but I'm not winning anymore. And I wasn't winning that much as a 12 year old. So I think the fact that I had to adapt by moving into a big city from a small village, I think that made me um, uh, kind of, I think realize or even more independent than those boys who were doing the same hours, the same day with the same players. And I think they got a little stale maybe bored, um, maybe felt like, I always call it, maybe taking a piano lesson or violin lesson that the kid doesn't want to take and they were doing it. And I didn't do that. I didn't feel like I did that. So I think that's one of the main reasons. We grew up on lightning fast indoors and heavy, heavy, slow clay courts. And I think that's where the sweets from my generation, that's why we were pretty complete 
uh, on different surfaces. And I think that really helped me as well. So, but I think adapting, Andy, I think that was the big, big key. And I kept adapting and whatever age group I was playing and I turned pro very early and, and nothing seemed like it was too high for me to jump over. Uh, it was just one person on the other side of the net and I'll try to adapt to, to his strengths and weaknesses. And, and um, I, I think that's, that mindset got me to where I am or where well, I was. <laughs> let's let's call let's segue to another conversation that you and I have had that I believe this group will find fascinating. I know I did. You talk about adapting and adjusting and you've compared yourself to Roger Federer from the standpoint that you took a little time away uh, to work on your game and it was to develop a slice backhand which by 1988 you had really perfected and it was really the weapon that you used to get that win over Yvonne Lendl in that US Open final. But you talked about the adjustments that Roger has made, probably largely in deference to the way he was being manhandled by Nadal for quite some time. But you felt that Roger's ability to adjust and adapt was something that was a little bit more sustained in his case than it was in your case. And you were a little bit jealous of him with regard to that. Elaborate on that a little bit. I found that fascinating. Well, geez, Roger Federer, two sets of twins, girls and boys. Uh, I think we're all jealous of Roger Federer, um, maybe the most honest uh, professional athlete uh, that I've ever run, in, run into. Yeah, I think that I, I played with a lot of intensity as a kid. Um, when I turned pro at 16, I won the French Open on clay in 82. I hadn't turned 18. I didn't really do much with the tennis ball. I was just trying to keep it in play. Uh, and if you could hurt me, then go ahead. I wasn't really going to hurt you. Uh, so I found my intensity level was really, really high. And, and I kept that going for until 1985. So about four or five years on tour, my intensity level was very high. Then I met my now wife uh, in 1985, lost a little bit of intensity for, for obvious reasons. Some other things were more interesting and more, uh, more important to me. But I started to to, I always knew how to slice a backhand, but I started to use it a little bit more because I was getting sick and tired of being bullied by my neighbor at the time, Ivan Landel, because uh, we both live in Greenwich, Connecticut. So, so I realized I got to slow the game down a little bit, give him, uh, give him nothing, no pace, nothing to hit off. I never did it to try and win against Ivan Landel in, in big matches. I just didn't want to lose the same way again. So... I started slicing the backhand, and of course, when you do that, and you start coming to the net, tennis was so much fun suddenly, because I was playing points that I've never played before, uh, but I was always able to play a uh, serve and volley and come to the net, and some decent, decent success in Australia. I won the Australian Open a couple of times on grass, uh, but still, um, my intensity level was, was, uh, was very high at the baseline game. So I think the difference with Roger Federer, so I changed, and I won... Uh, in, in, in 1988, obviously, I won a couple of hardcore slams, became number one in the world. And I was slicing a lot of backhands. Top spin backhand used to be my strength. So I had to rethink how do I win points with a slice backhand and not with my top spin backhand. So obviously, I was hitting it at times. And I could keep the intensity of serving and volleying more than normal, slicing the backhand. I kept that intensity level at the same level as being from the baseline for about two years. Two years. After two years, I stopped winning, uh, and I lost my kind of motivation to solve problems. So Roger Federer, the difference there is that he played the way he played early on, and he ran into Rafa Nadal. Uh, then he changed his racket. He started coming over his backhand, uh, and that's all good. That's easy to do for all of us is to change your game. The hard thing is to, to number one, have fun fighting – uh, with, with a game style that you might not be that familiar with, but you know is necessary to win. Now, winning isn't everything in tennis. Being able to compete and fight uh, 100% emotionally, physically, tactically, and technically is really what it's about. Winning is a byproduct of not wanting to practice the next day, rather play a match in front of people. Uh, so I think that Federer proved in 2017 when he came back, that his intensity level was exactly the same as it had been before. And then, of course, he won the Australian Open. And, and now I think he got confidence in playing like that. I kept playing that same slice backhand, serving and volleying a little bit more than normal until 1996 was my last year. So I spent about 
six years on tour, seven years nearly, trying to find the intensity, trying to win matches. And once in a while, I would be the top 10 player because they, they sort of went nuts when, when I was just running and slicing my back. But I really feel that changing the game is not a problem for, for professional tennis players. It's just feeling at home, fighting as hard. And I think I, I've worked with some tennis academies. I've uh, been up with JTCC up in College Park uh, with Vesa Panka, and, and I've run some practices. And, and, and I used to try and get the kids to listen. You're going to serve and volley on the first serve, every first serve, and you're going to take your opponent's second serve, hit your return and come in. And they can all do it. But it's just that they wouldn't fight with the same intensity level. Losing suddenly didn't mean as much because they're not playing their game. And I think that's what is a great champion in Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer. Those two maybe more so than Novak Djokovic, but um, the intensity level of those guys is unbelievable, even though they keep elaborating and their game is developing at all times. So I'm not comparing myself with Roger Federer more than the fact that I have four kids, Andy. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, Matt, one of the things that I found, um, I, I would say to be a relief to me, was that some of the things that I profess on the court every day with juniors and, and adult club players is really close to your philosophy uh, about practicing, which is that this is a, this is a team effort. And you make the statement that the person on the other side of the net in a practice session is not your opponent. That is your practice partner. And it is incumbent upon you to make sure that the next hour that you two spend on the court is the best hour it can be for him. And that you feel that if you do that, he and he or she will in turn do that for you. I think that's something that all of us as coaches probably, uh, you know, it, it bears reminding to all of us and to all of our players. And I would love for you to chat about that a little bit. Yeah, well, it's very natural, obviously, if, I, if you've played a team sport, to have that attitude, I think, was more natural. And uh, being an a ice hockey player, of course, every Swedish boy wants to play ice hockey. Most Swedish girls wants to play ice hockey, too, now. Uh, so uh, it's a huge sport uh, in Sweden, as big as it is in Canada. So team spirit was built there. I played soccer as well. Uh, but I think more than anything, uh, when I turned pro at 16, I was very lucky to be uh, joined in with three other players, Joachim Nyström, who got the top 10 in the world, uh, Anders Jared, of course, one of, I think, one of the best doubles players of all time. Uh, he got the top five in singles as well, number one in doubles. Uh, and, and another player, Hans Simonsen, who won the French Open in doubles with Anders Jared. So we got one coach, and we traveled together for uh, from 1980 till about 1984. And I was the youngest in that group. So even though I won the French and I'd won uh, four majors before my 21st birthday, I'm the one getting the deck of cards. Uh, I'm the one uh, grabbing, I was going to say the beers for the boys, but most probably cups of coffees for the older. It didn't matter how many majors I had won. So we always practiced together. Uh, we played Davis Cup together. I think and. It, I've won seven majors in singles and a, and a Wimbledon doubles, which I would never trade for a Wimbledon singles, by the way, because uh, it was with my best friend, Joachim Newstrom. Uh, but more proud I am about getting to the Davis Cup finals seven years in a row uh, in Sweden, 83 through 83 to 89. So I think that's, uh, that's because we have such competitive team spirit where – uh, yes, if I didn't win Wimbledon in 1988, who would I like to win it? Well, of course, Stefan Edberg, and he happened to win it. So uh, I think that we, it was very natural for Swedes to hang together, to practice together, to work together, and realizing that, hey, Mats is winning Grand Slams now, and then suddenly Anders Jared and Joachim Newstrom realize, well, he can, we should be able to do very well. I think today, uh, tennis is always talk about a very individual sport. Very often today, uh, sort of juniors, they have one coach. Uh, coaches don't really, they, co they don't focus on, on as many players as they used to. It's easy for a player to, um, to think that they're competing with, with the kid next door and, and because he's taken, you know, the limelight away from him. He's taken the spot into the nationals, whatever it may be. And, and, and that does not help at all. I think America had a, you guys have, have, have a great uh, generation, obviously with 
with Pete Sampras and Agassi and, and Jim Courier, whether they were all friends or not, I'm not sure, but they certainly were uh, uh, in the same age group and, and they helped each other out by showing uh, the right path. I think Andy Roddick, James Blake, Marty Fish, uh, the Bryan brothers, they had something like that going as well. I think they proved uh, that uh, hanging together and helping each other out, that's what it's all about. And I think on an amateur level, that's what, what it is about every single time. It's tough. Amateurs, what, play points 90% of the time, hit balls 10% of the time. As a pro, you must probably do it the other way around. So it's tough to get any better, but, but you've got to uh, practice with people that are worse than you. I mean, shame, poor Novak Djokovic. It's not easy for him to find somebody who's better than him. So I think that's where we need to educate more parents as well, uh, but also um, adults that are looking to improve their game, how much they can gain by being positive uh, about the situation on the practice court and helping each other out and forgetting about themselves um, and just having a good time and working hard. And then it's amazing how much you improve when you're, when you're not quite trying as hard emotionally, but you are uh, putting 100% effort uh, physically. We talked a lot, uh, Matt, in, in the beginning, the first show that we did of kickserveradio.com, uh, we compared and contrast the upbringing that you had in Sweden as a junior versus that that our, our, our third teammate, Johnny Levine, had, who was my teammate at Texas, and those people in the, in the Southern division may remember the match that he played with with Pern Fours in the semis of the NCAAs in 84. Um, and we talked about Johnny's experience at Boletari's and you sort of made some comparisons and contrasted what you all were doing in Europe versus what was going on in the United States and maybe is to, to some degree to this day. Talk a little bit more about that. I know that you always envied the big serve and the big forehand that the Americans had developed, but you maybe felt like the Europeans had developed certain things that the American game did. And I'd love, I'm sure everybody would love to hear you chat about that as well. You know, I think over the years, I think that, uh, well, certainly in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I think it's fair to say that, the European uh, male tennis pros are most probably slightly more all round uh, than, than the Americans. I think it has to do with the, the Europeans. They play indoors, they play outdoors, they play on fast carpets inside, and they play on slow clay courts. Uh, so I think we learned that. For, for us and my generation, we were all trying you know, to imitate Bjorn Borg, of course. Uh, and, uh, and we have one, one uh, coach in our club who was actually in a wheelchair. He, was, he had multiple sclerosis uh, at a very young age and he's still teaching tennis. And he said, well, Bjorn Borg is a little bit of a freak and we don't want you to try and play like Bjorn Borg. We want you to have that, that straight uh, backswing on the forehand. We want you to have a continental grip and that two-handed backhand. It, it's just, you just keep it until you're strong enough. Bjorn Borg, that's not how, how you play tennis. So we we were trying to imitate Bjorn, but then told to, to play more of a, more of a sort, sort of coming to the net game on fast courts. Uh, and, uh, and so we were very complete in Sweden, even though we chose to stay at the back the whole time like I did, or Stefan Edberg, who used to be a baseliner, didn't enjoy that very much, and then changed to a one-handed backhand and decided that coming to the net is where he found his intensity level. So... Uh, I think I, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with Jimmy Arias. You know, he's a week older than me. Um, we never ended up playing in the juniors because he was always playing up at the Orange Bowl or the Port Washington. But um, I know I've heard Jimmy say this too, that when he, when he kind of was working at Nick Bolletier, and he would have been some of the, one of the first players, he said people were very afraid of touching his game with the fear that his great forehand, which is one of the best of all time, I think, that, that they would take away from his game style of winning, which was basically hitting great forehands. And I think Jimmy didn't quite develop an all-court game. Uh, and I've heard sort of Jimmy say, not complain, but he wishes they would have spent some more time on coming to the net and learn how to volley and, and play a little bit more doubles and be more complete. So I think that's uh, what, what uh, Johnny Levine, I think that's what I kind of heard from him too. I think Nick Bolletier is an incredible motivating coach. Uh, but I think he was basically the one that, that kind of decided, let's hit as many forehands as we possibly can. 
and uh, let's hit a lot of them out of a basket because they're not coming back anyway. Uh, and in Sweden, that was never the case. We didn't play out of a basket. So I would have loved to have a big serve and a big forehand, but um, it, it, uh, it never happened. And I, and I had to become more all around than most Swedes. And I think Europeans in general, I do believe there's a change in American tennis because of the uh, introduction of playing on clay courts more. Uh, the center in Orlando, I know they practice a lot more on, on hard through down there than they used to in the past. So I'm sure it's changing, uh, but I think overall, I think in Europe, it's a little bit more about playing the total game, learning how to do everything. That's nearly more important than it is to win. One of the conversations that we've had, Matt's as well, which has kind of you know gone hand in hand with what we're talking about right now, is maybe the fact that a lot of coaches and and you said, well, no, this isn't just an American thing. This is something that's going on worldwide right now. Is that the focus is more on the offensive side of the sport and the weapons of mass destruction, and 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 the massive ground game and hitting winners. And you feel like the ability to defend the court to some extent gets put on the back burner maybe more than it should yet when you look at Roger Federer and you watch Rafael Nadal and I would probably say Djokovic as much as anybody that when you hear John McEnroe and some of the other great analysts calling their matches you always hear them talk about their amazing ability to defend the court should we as coaches be more focused on some of the defensive skills that we see from those guys uh, to, to round out the game the way you suggest I mean, I do. When you look at those three guys, you look at the whole uh, the whole men's tour. I think they're they're maybe a step ahead of the on the women's tour uh, because of the defensive skills of a man being able to cover the court. It's amazing. It's pretty incredible that the better uh, the better that players are hitting the tennis ball, um, the more important it is to be good defensively rather than the other way around. Um, I remember Jose Higueras. A uh, great, obviously, USTA coach, but also a great player. He, he told me once that uh, he, they made a study and the, and the ball uh, lasted less than three shots on average um, on the men's tour and were practicing the, uh, which I'm not a big fan of the expression, but the one-two punch, uh, the serve and then uh, return and play, but then go for the next shot. And I think, uh, yes, most points are, are one like that. Tough to do that uh, when the, when it's four all and deuce. A lot of a lot of points at four all and deuce are won by not missing. Very few matches are won by hitting winners in the crucial stages. Uh, so I do think that with the fitness and the uh, the science behind training, I think the men's game is is kind of heading back towards if you don't have defensive skills, you really can't you can't compete. But of course. When you have the chance to be aggressive, um, you know you you got to you got to dictate and win the point. I have the question all the time. I'm saying you got you can't miss. And they say uh, the the juniors or the kids say, yeah, but but that's how I play. I play very aggressive. I say, well, keep on playing aggressively. Just don't miss. You know that's a huge difference. I remember Jimmy Connors. I think when he coached Andy Roddick, he came in to the locker room in 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 Melbourne after one of Roddick's matches, and, and I was in there, and Jimmy came up to me and says, hmm, strange, not missing is still winning. And I think that's, that's really uh, what tennis, I, I find it the more interesting tennis, and I think it, you can develop your defensive skills, you can get somewhere uh, in the world in tennis. But if you just have an offensive game, you're going to have off days, and then suddenly you're not ranked in, in the top sort of, uh, three, four thousand, but on a good day, you can be ranked in sort of top 50, top 100. But with good defensive skills, your worst day uh, is not much worse than your best day. Matt, I think one of the things that this group might enjoy hearing from you on, I know I would, I see 115 people uh, on the call right now. It has to do with tennis parenting. And you come at this philosophy from, from two different uh, directions. One is that you're a father of four, as you mentioned earlier, but also now you deal with a lot of the parents of the juniors uh, that you're working with. And I think we probably all have 
some similarities in the way we approach this and we feel like the kids need to be able to develop independence, but we also feel that some people feel that the parents should have more of a role than others. Kind of where do you fall in line with when a parent gets a little bit heavy handed? Uh, how do you handle that? Well, I mean, as, as I said before, I'm really, I'm a rookie. I'm a rookie at teaching tennis uh, on a daily basis out of a club. So I have, for example, I have a six year old girl uh, and I got her three times a week. We play one hour, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, we play all kinds of uh, target games. And we actually have her favorite game is a game when we play over the netting that separates court one and two. And then there are some holes in the net and we, you're allowed to hit it there. You're allowed to hit it uh, on the side, along the, the tarp in the back. So I think having fun uh, is my main uh, goal with her. But the difference here, and I, and, and I like to, I feel like I can make it short, but my son, Carl, was the first coach that she had two years ago. And he was, uh, he's really good at the technical side, and he's obviously more modern than me. So, so he helped her develop really good technique in the ground strokes uh, and also in the serve. Uh, and so he spent a lot of time there. And when I started working with her about a year ago, um, I, it was nothing I could tell her technically. So then I started with the etiquette. You know, you apologize. If you hit the top of the net, you apologize. If I hit a good shot, you tell me good shot. Uh, you call the ball in. If it's close, you're not sure, it's in. Every single time the ball is in if it's close to the line. So I think that I went that direction. And I think that really helped the parents as well. They used to pick up the balls. Uh, while we were, we were practicing because they thought, well, we'll save some time and uh, she'll have more time with me. And, uh, and eventually now we got to a point where, no, you're not allowed to do that. And uh, the way I got that is, does she have shorts that she can put the tennis ball in her pocket? And of course she didn't. Now she's got shorts. Now she can put the tennis ball in her pocket so she can hit two serves. So that, that was solved. They realized that they are not allowed to pick up balls. So I think that the, the problem I can see and that I will run into is that when you're coaching and when you're on your own, you're trying to teach kids all these different things. It's nearly like you have to put more importance to one or the other. And to me, uh, etiquette, uh, good attitude, footwork, preparation, recovery, things you can control are, is by far more important than than the stroke itself and the end result. Um, I, th I think if you learn the things that you can control with tennis, I think tennis can be a great life lesson. And I think that's the, the, the main reason why we should play tennis is because you have to solve problems on your own. Uh, and uh, I think it can help you in life, or at least you have some options when you try to solve the problem. I gotta tell you very quick, Todd Martin's story, because I'm very into footwork uh, and, uh, and the etiquette and good behavior and good attitude. So I introduced Todd Martin at uh, some clinics we did up in Newport. And I, everybody knew, of course, who Todd Martin was. So I said to everyone, well, Todd Martin, you guys know him. Uh, he's the best ball striker that I've ever played against. Uh, but I also said, and the, the discrepancy between his movement and ball striking is the biggest I've ever seen, because he's not a great mover. Uh, and Todd Martin said to me, said, well, thank you very much, Matt. You're actually wrong. And I'm like, which one, Todd? Is it the ball striking or the, no, 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 about my movement. And he said to me, I'm actually a great mover, always was. I was just really slow. <laughs> I think that says it all. That is so important that you can be a better mover, however slow you move. The basis of moving is the same for a slow person as it is to Novak Djokovic. It's, it's the same. The feet are supposed to be in the same place, but it's tougher to get to. So, so I think that I see the problem with trying to teach kids um, everything. And I think if you are able to, you might be, they might be playing too much at too young an age, and then they might lose interest at some point. So it's a tough situation. I don't have the answer. I'd like to now invite the group if you guys want to throw a question or two uh, into the chat and I'll, I'll relay those over to Matt's. But in the meantime, while you guys are maybe formulating one or two of those, Matt's, you did mention, and I apologize for not doing so in the intro, you did buy Gravity Fitness and Tennis in Haley, Idaho with the intention of hopefully 
uh, creating an, uh, an inbound resort arrangement so that pros like the ones on this call can put a group together, come out, escort them out to Haley. You've got three indoor courts. Tell the, tell the group a little bit about what you're trying to do. This is not going to be an academy style training per se. This is going to be more experiential where you get to come out and enjoy nature in Idaho. And by the way, I will mention to all of you that social distancing in Haley, Idaho is a pretty easy thing to do. Uh, so that's not a, that's not tough. Uh, but talk a little bit about what you have going on out there. And if you want to extend the invitation to the group, let's get a couple thousand people out there soon. Absolutely. Andy. Yes. Yeah, so obviously, uh, where I am is Sun Valley, Idaho is sort of the stage name. And I, I'm sure most people most probably are familiar with, with Sun Valley, a great ski resort one had the first chairlift in the world, uh, on bald mountain. So, uh, we have everything here except the ocean. We have a beach actually at, at uh, Alpine Lakes, but we don't have the ocean, but we have everything, fly fishing, golf, tennis, tennis, alpine skiing, cross country skiing. So I find that um, my goal is to hope to have people come here and want to play tennis with me uh, or Andy when you come with, with some of your friends and your group, uh, but also spend uh, maybe two, three hours on a tennis court a day, but then also go out and, and look at other things uh, to, to recreate with hiking, mountain biking, because I think people, uh, we might not realize, but I think that if you can spend two and a half, three hours in one session as a quality time, I think it gives a lot more uh, than if you go twice a day and you, you sort of kill yourself for five days because you want to get as much time on court as possible. I think going to these uh, tennis academies and schools, you have to be fresh. If you're going to get the information and do something with it, you have to be mentally really, really fresh. And repetition is not going to make you a better tennis player if you go to, to ING Academy or whatever it is for six days and play six hours a day. It'll make you a better you know, ground stroke player during that time, but you'll lose it. So I think the fundamentals and being fresh and pick up on a few things is what I'm hoping and trying to do. Uh, so perfect for a group to come and, and hang out and do all these things together. College team, high school team, uh, women's uh, team, 4035, whatever it is. I think that we don't, you know, the new ranch in Texas, uh, they do an unbelievable job there and they have some great events, but uh, they might not have this side. So I'm not trying to compete with the biggest academies or tennis schools in any way. Uh, but I can compete with the other things you can enjoy in Sun Valley, Idaho. And, and for that reason, the quality of the tennis most probably will be pretty high because of the, um, because of the location. 6,000 feet as well. That's really good. We play uh, with, with seaside balls so, or uh, regular um, altitude balls, and they're not flying as much as you would think. Uh, so it's a really, really uh, important part of my life to try and not bring people here for the sake of, of the community as well, but it's more about trying to have people realize that cross-training, even if you're in your mid-50s, cross-training is going to make you a better tennis player, not hitting millions of tennis balls necessarily. Are you speaking to anyone in particular with that whole mid-50s comment? Is that <laughs> um, Mike Harden has a question I think uh, that you might want to take on, which is do you put more of a premium on group clinics or individual lessons for junior development, Matt? Uh, without a doubt, group clinics. I think that, um, I, I mean, if I had a, a, a kid that plays five hours a week, I would hope to, to uh, spend one hour with that kid maybe by myself and then spend maybe another two with him or her and another three players on court. I think when you go past the number of four players plus the coach I think it gets a little bit crowded on the tennis court and I think in that case in my world anyway I think it would be better to spend a shorter amount of time on the court but make it all about quality uh, and then I think but, but I think having friends around uh, and, and discipline I mean you can have fun without laughing on the tennis court but I think somehow create that team camaraderie uh, on the practice court and then that spills over into uh, when the club or the team goes to nationals and, and you go and sit and watch each other play at all times. I mean, she's, I, I can't, I've played so many big matches when some of the Swedish guys, my friends, Peter Lundgren, Joachim Nystrom, 
they would stick around for three or four days just because we're friends and because we play cards every night. Uh, and we had some restaurant we used to go to and they didn't want to go home. And I was still in the tournament sometimes. And so I think the team camaraderie is built on the practice court. And I think that's also where you can get your competitive edge uh, and learn about your opponent. Because the one thing we do not uh, do, I think, as well anymore as we used to, is read our opponent. And I think that has to do with the power that everybody possesses these days. I think we're thinking about ourselves a little bit more than in the past. But I think reading your opponent, I mean, when you listen to Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal during the Labor Cup, <laughs> you realize that reading your opponent uh, is an art form that will never die. And that is really where you can um, make your, your biggest improvements as a tennis player. I tell people I'm a great tennis player when the ball is on the other side of the court. Well, I, great points. And as far as you and your friends closing down restaurants, we could get into that. But uh, Tori's kids are in the room, and I don't. Uh, that subject matter for another time. Um, uh, Krista Andre makes uh, has a great question here, which is something uh, that you have had some experience with. It, it to, you've admitted it, uh, which is what are the main reasons for burnout for junior players? From your point of view, it's something that when I asked you, God, how did it feel when you got to one in the world? You beat Lendl, and what happened from there? And you were like. I was burned out. So talk about that and how to maybe avoid that and what you're seeing in it in this day and age. Well, I think obviously winning, um, winning early puts, puts enough pressure on you and, and enough expectations where the burnout can come even as a 15, 16 year old, for sure. Um, I think to me, it's, it's education and knowledge. Uh, about the game, um, some of its history as well, to know the game, but, but to try and di to, to, to work away at, at, lear at, at learning how to volley, learning how to hit a slice backhand, and using all these different tools uh, in practice and in matches. And, and I think keeping it fun is by far the most important thing. And when you keep it fun, you're also the best, your best competitor is when you're having fun. Um, that doesn't mean you have to fool around to have fun, but, but when you're in a situation where you never really have your back up against the wall uh, in terms of uh, trying to find a solution, not a solution to win the match, just a solution to try and get closer to your opponent if he's too good for you early on, just to get closer to them or get further away from them towards the end of the match than you were early on. I don't think it's, it's based on on necessarily on winning. I think it's just to try and, and develop an all-around game. And then that's fun. I don't remember being in a tennis match where I felt really desperate before or after that there was something that I couldn't quite do. Um, obviously, uh, I never felt limited. Uh, again, I, I decided to win my points from the baseline. Goran Ivanisevic knows how to play from the baseline. He decided that he wants to win most of his points serving and coming in. But, you know, Pete Sampras I interviewed once when Rafa Nadal started winning the French Open four, five, six times. And uh, he was playing an exhibition in, uh, on clay in uh, Stuttgart, I think it was. And I asked him, I worked for Eurosport, and I asked Pete, I said, how would you play Rafa Nadal on clay? And he said, well, I would make sure that Rafa never hit more than two shots in any rally. That would be 100% definitely the plan. And I said, oh, okay, interesting. How do you think you do? Oh, no chance. I wouldn't, win a, I wouldn't win a set. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you how you have to play against him. How do I beat him? No idea. So I think that's how you prevent burnout, is to try and challenge the kids with knowledge and uh, education in technique, in learning about your opponent's technique. Now, whether you have a great forehand technically or if it's just physically a great forehand doesn't mean you don't know what great technique is supposed to look like on the other side of the net. I think that's another area where I never felt limited because, hey, I'm sure I can find a weakness in this guy's game. I don't know if I can win the match, but I'm sure I can find his weakness. And then that became the goal rather than the end result. All right, Matt, so getting some great comments here. Clearly, this group is enjoying what they're hearing from you, although there is somebody here who's accusing you of not having a Swedish accent. Ha! So, uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'm going to ask you a question because it's something that we've discussed and I don't think we ever get tired of it. They showed these highlights recently when you were on Tennis Channel Live talking about our show, which was cool, but the McEnroe match. And everybody knows the one I'm referring to. 
1982. You, I believe you're still 17. Now you've got a birthday coming up. I happen to know for a fact in a couple of weeks, you'll be 56. But back at age 17, you're playing Johnny Mac. It's Davis Cup. It's in St. Louis. This thing goes six plus hours. What was going through your mind? You've said to me before, you didn't think you had a chance going into that match, but lo and behold, you gave McEnroe everything he could handle and more. I'm sure this group would kind of love to hear about what was going through your mind during that whole thing. Yeah, I think first thing that's important to note is that John McEnroe had just come back from Wimbledon having lost to his dear friend Jimmy Connors in the finals. <laughs> uh, and I think that didn't sit very well with uh, John. And then I think he wanted revenge because obviously John uh, is, is a Davis Cup hero for America and for the, for the tournament itself because he always played Davis Cup. So I think he was a little bit down, maybe a little bit loss of confidence. But I... Nothing really went through my mind. I didn't think I had a chance to win. It was a fast indoor court. I just kept fighting. I was down two sets and a break after about an hour and 40 minutes. And then I happened to turn around the, the third set in nearly three hours, no tiebreaker. And then with that, I won the fourth. But a more, most important part of my, about my tennis career is Bjorn Borg. Bjorn Borg, not only did we try and play like him, but we also grew up seeing Bjorn beat Jimmy Connors uh, in the Wimbledon final, winning the French Open, beating uh, Guillermo Vilas, beating Ivan Lendl, beating John McEnroe in the finals of Wimbledon 1980. So I've seen uh, with, with my own eyes on TV how you can play John and feel like you you playing him, playing him the right way. Again, doesn't mean I thought I had a chance to win, but I kind of had an idea because Bjorn, that's how Bjorn plays. So I'm going to try and kind of imitate Bjorn in every way I can never to the same level as him because he's, uh, he's uh, not one step ahead of me, but maybe uh, overlooked when it comes to uh, the greatest player of all time. I think Bjorn Borg is much closer to the top than we realize because he really was dominant. He just happened to not win the U.S. Open, even though he made a bunch of finals. And he played the Australian Open only once. So Borg was massive and he paved the way, t not only technically with his loopy backswings and 200 backhand, but tactically we kind of oh that's how you play jimmy connors you kind of hit a little low slice to his forehand because even bjorn was trying to do that to jimmy at times and uh, i think that's really what didn't give me the belief to win but it gave me the belief that at least i know what i'm trying to accomplish tactically but you know john we always talk we talk about this match all the time and and john always says well everybody says it was such a great match huh how come half the stadium left after five hours? Uh, and that's true. <laughs> it wasn't full in the end. So, yeah, very dramatic. Good match. Good level. Uh, obviously went through the whole night in Sweden. So maybe the most important tennis match that I've played that I didn't win uh, was losing to him there and losing to Yannick Noah in the French Open Finals in 1983. Learned way more from those two losses than any win or any Grand Slam title. Well, Matt, uh, Lori wants to know why you're not a commentator on Tennis Channel, and it's because you're on Eurosport, but now you have a podcast on the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, so you're at least a part of Tennis Channel. Uh, but one quick question before we go, then I want to turn it back over to Pat and Kevin, and that is we, we talked about the burnout question. You and I have talked about Coco Goff. I know you absolutely love that kid, but with the pressure that she is under at such a young age, Danny Tarpley asks, is she a prime candidate for burnout? I think that's a good question. I think that's a great question. Obviously, I was really, really um, excited, surprised, amazed uh, that she uh, publicly made comments uh, about the, the, the whole uh, racial situation in, in the U.S. and, of course, in the whole world, but with the police force and whatnot. And the fact that, the fact that she... Uh, I knew she would have the guts to do it because I've heard her press conferences during Wimbledon uh, when she was there and did so well. But, but for her to, to, uh, to even go out there and, and do that and for her parents to, I guess, allow her to do that, I, I think that is going to help uh, prevent her from a burnout because I think she's interested in, in life and tennis is part of life. Tennis isn't her life. I think life... Uh, is is uh, way more important than tennis is, is just um, sort of a, a byproduct of what she is and, and how, how hard she works and how smart she is and she happens to be a tennis player. So I don't think that burnout is going to necessarily happen there. I don't, I, I hope not. She's a great 
uh, athlete um, and, and uh, a talent. We don't know how good, big a talent she is. We know she's a great athlete. That's for sure. She looks talented. She seems talented. She seems like she has uh, the, the weapons to hit slice forehands on the center court at Wimbledon on grass to turn a match around. I mean, that's insane at her age. So um, I think so. Um, so I, I think she's a big hope. I think there's so many young girls coming up that are great players in America. Uh, the U.S. has, has a lot of them. Um, but uh, I think that the U.S. is going to look, we, I call, even though I'm not an American citizen, I do pull for America in tennis uh, as much or maybe even more than Swedish tennis, tennis players because I've spent more of my life in America than, than in Sweden. But i just like to say, Andy, before, um, you know, my son played in the Intermountain Tennis Conference uh, and I travel with him a little bit to some tournaments. I've, I've traveled with my kids' high school teams. They're all four of them played high school tennis. And I, and I got introduced to the Intermountain Tennis, high school tennis in Idaho. And the, I'm so impressed with the attitude, uh, the sportsmanship that was going on in high school. Uh, and uh, I was, I was uh, honor, on, honored, Andy, to come to the Intermountain Tennis Conference in Denver with you. And, and I think that what I'm realizing is that I was always pretty humble in, in, uh, in, uh, in how I approached professional tennis off the court. But no way was I humble on the court because I always thought I had a chance to win or turn matches around. But I am humbled again uh, by really starting a new uh, adventure in trying to run a tennis club. I am open for advice and suggestions, but more advice, actually, because I really don't quite know what I'm doing. Um, I'm just trying to have fun and uh, hope people enjoy uh, uh, the sport as much as I did because I can never ever pay back to the sport of tennis what it has given me uh, so any advice any suggestions that you guys have for somebody like me because seven Grand Slam singles titles doesn't do anything for me uh, when I get to the club in the morning and I'm vacuuming the courts because one of the lady members thought there was too much ball fluff tennis ball fluff on court two mats could you please uh, and I'm like, sure, and I love doing it. And I don't want anyone else to do it. I want to do it because I want to be uh, put back down. And my respect for guys like you, Andy, uh, is goes out to you being a coach and, and full-time uh, teaching pro and really knowing what you, um, what you do is unbelievable. And to keep the intensity level that you guys do for eight hours on a tennis court while thinking about somebody else, never really about yourself, that uh, it deserves a lot of respect. So you guys really are the champions of our sport and you're pushing the, pushing the passion forwards. I was just lucky uh, and fortunate that I had uh, talent to win tennis matches. But, but I, I'm, a, I'm in the back seat now, so I'm really excited to start this part of my life. So thank you, everyone. Well, I want to thank you, and I'm glad you were able to read my handwriting about the comments that I asked you to read about me. Uh, so that that helped. Uh, thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm still seeing, uh, you know, comments coming in about uh, how great, you know, these people love you, Matt, and, and so do I. And, and having the opportunity to be a business partner and do the podcast where we are has been a real treat. And I knew that USPTA Southern would find you as endearing as we do here in Intermountain. And I'm reading these comments and you guys are all amazing and and. and very sweet and we appreciate the support and uh, obviously Matt's is a guy that we've always rooted for on the court and I think if we can get our players to conduct themselves on the court and off the court in any way shape or form the way this Vlander guy has done it all these years I think we're, we're, we're putting some some pretty good junior players into our sport uh, at this point I want to again thank all of you Hopefully, Thank hopefully you. you'll catch us on kickserveradio.com and now turn it over to Pat Whitworth and Kevin Theos. And guys, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy. Guys, thank you so much. Matt, Andy, amazing. Love it. Andy, the voice. I mean, it's just amazing, but I see why now you've got that amazing microphone. So uh, oh, do we all sound like you if we get that microphone? I'll see what I can do. I mean, I, maybe I need to uh, become like a rep or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's just me. You're awesome. Thanks, All right, buddy. Kevin. Well, that's it. All right. Andy, Matt, thank you so much. That was absolutely terrific.
Uh, thank you. So Pleasure. Thank, thank you again. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Hopefully you guys well, we will come out. We appreciate everybody. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, hopefully you guys will come out our way and we'd love to see, you know, folks from Southern come out and catch a little cool weather. But I mean, Matt's means it when he says two things. A, he means it when he says, come visit him in Haley, Idaho. And B, when he says he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. It's true. And if you all will come out there and help him figure this thing out with these six-year-olds and these ladies that are helping him, want him to vacuum the court, he needs our help. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.